Good to go. Very good. Welcome to my talk about asymmetric heterogeneous multiprocessing, HMP, HMP, mainline Linux, and Cephyr in Unison. My name is uh, Marcel Ziswiller. I joined Toradex in 2011. I spearheaded there the embedded Linux adoption. Uh, I introduced upstream first policy, and at times was top 10 U-boot and Linux kernel arm sock contributor. We have an industrial embedded Linux platform called Torizon, which is fully based on mainline technology, uses mainline U-boot with DistroBoot, KMS, DRM graphics with uh, Etnaweave, Nuvo, uh, ODR update with OS3 and Docker, respectively Podman for the application container interface. What will we cover today? Uh, we have a look at the evolution of the microcontroller, and then we look at the integration of such into the Linux ecosystem. We have a quick overview of open source real-time operating system, RTOSs, and then I'm going to look at the HMP, HMP life cycle. So basically how one can actually uh, launch code on such the systems, and then we're going to look at the mainline Linux and Zephyr, how they uh, work together with the remote proc and RP message. And also have a look at the communication libraries. And at the end, if there is enough time, I will try some live, real life demo. So the microcontroller. It started with the Texas Instruments, TMS-1000. It was a 4-bit one. That was 1971. Uh, later, Intel 8048 was an 8-bit one in 1977. Then the Intel 8086, first 16-bit one in 78. Then the Motorola HCO5 is quite a common one. That one actually had a serial bootloader, which allowed EEPROM use for program storage, which was kind of a unique concept. And later, for example, the microchip PIX. In 1993, they also allowed rapid prototyping with in-system programming. How about the ecosystem around such microcontroller use cases in Linux. Of course, one thing is the whole interfacing. So there are I2C, memory mapped I.O., SPI, all these are supported in kernel subsystems, which can be used to communicate with another side, which of course can also be such a microcontroller. There is also generic register map, reg map support, which helps uh, in such use cases. Then another thing that usually you might have is you want a way to actually run or download the firmware to such microcontrollers. And for that, there is an in-kernel uh, firmware API that allows, uh, basically got introduced to update the microcode of the main CPUs for all these erratas that are there, not. But it also allows to uh, update driver firmware, device driver firmware, basically. For example, if such a device has an integrated microcontroller. Often, it is also used to update some more driver information data, for example, calibration data, stuff like that. How does it work? It for the firmware requests, you can have synchronous ones. So basically, it calls the request firmware. And then uh, when that completes, it copies that firmware to the device. And then it releases it again. Or you can also have an asynchronous uh, use case where it basically won't uh, block on that. And another thing is a special optimization for reboot. So if you reboot, it, it basically could be that 
your device still running and you don't need to kind of reload the firmware. For that, there is this firmware request cache. And the upload API, so it basically has a persistent SysFS node, which enables you also to kind of kick such an update from there. And that, for example, is used also to uh, program FPGAs, for example. You find more information in the documentation driver API firmware introduction RST. Then another thing that is available is so-called multifunction miscellaneous device, the MFT framework. That can also be used to uh, basically, if you have such heterogeneous uh, hardware blocks, that basically make or offer more than one functionality, you could use that to, to provide that then to multiple uh, specific device drivers. Uh, also for external bus interfacing, for example, or also this whole memory registers. If you have a register set where in the same register set you, you might have different bits that might be used in different drivers, something like that. Oftentimes, this is the case in this so-called Syscon uh, use case. No? And then, of course, we have also HTTP, HTTP integrated. Nowadays, a lot of system on chips have multiple such, uh, I mean, not only multiple cores in an SMP configuration, but also really multiple core complexes in such uh, heterogeneous configurations. And there, we're going to look at the remote proc RP message later. Then I want to give a quick overview of the real-time OS uh, landscape. I'm not actually going to go through all those, but just quickly, there is like ECOS, for example. FreeRTOS is a well-known contender. We, a new one from ARM, the Embed OS. Then an old player is the micro C OS 3. Nutex is often also used. Another one is Riot. And an interesting one is the RT Thread. It's actually a contender from China. So they kind of wanted to also get more into this real time space. Uh, other one, Artems. And then, of course, Zephyr. Zephyr originated from Virtuos Artos, uh, which was used for DSPs. And Windriver basically acquired that via this Belgian software company, Ionic, in 2001. And they renamed it as Rocket and basically open sourced it and made it royalty free. That was in November 2015. Uh, it is, uh, can be used for much smaller memory needs as compared to VxWorks. So it's really suitable for this kind of sensor single function embedded devices. And meanwhile, in, in 2016, it then got hosted as a collaborative project in the Linux Foundation, and it got renamed to Zephyr. And early members of the Zephyr supporters included uh, Intel, NXP Semiconductor, Synopsys, Linaro, Texas Instruments, Device Tone, Nordic Semi, Oticon, and Bose. Uh, it's based on a small monolithic kernel, and it has very flexible configuration, which is actually at build time configured. And it also includes a set of protocol stacks, IPv4, V6, uh, the constraint application protocol, and various other protocols. Virtual file system interface, and management of device firmware update mechanisms, and it uses a similar K-config on device tree. However, it's implemented here in Python for portability reasons. And the build system is actually based on CMake. And Interesting, so this really has the largest number of contributions and commits compared to any of the other uh, 
uh, art losses uh, as of January 2022. So it's really the, has the most active uh, user base, basically. And Apache 2.0 license. Now let's have a look at the life cycle. So how do we actually get code on, in such a heterogeneous uh, environment on such a core? How do we get that running? One approach would be that from a boot container by the boot ROM. Unfortunately, as you can see, if I dig that up, none of this uh, IMX7 or 8 M mini or plus support that not supported. They all only start, the boot ROM starts the A course, and there is no other way. You cannot strap that differently or whatever. So only your bootloader later could then load code for there. However, there are others like the IDOTMX8 Quadmax or the 8X that do support that. However, they support that through this uh, system control unit. So the system control unit is made of a Cortex-M4 processor. So even that itself it's, it has its own M4 core. However, the, it runs proprietary firmware. So the application processor and the Cortex-M4, they have no direct access to any of these hardware mechanisms. So the hardware mechanisms are abstracted in that uh, SCU firmware. And as you might know, that SU firmware is highly proprietary closed source stuff. So not really too nice. Anyway, other SOC vendors might have better support for such use cases. Then, like I said, if we cannot do it from the boot ROM, we can do it once it's in our hands, not? We can, for example, run U-boot on the A-core, and there, there is so-called boot aux command, and that supports basically running firmware four or seven cores. That is called config IMX boot aux, and it's available for IMX6, so the, the SX variant, the 7, 8M, including the Minion Plus. And also the Fibrid, which actually also can have an M4, it's kind of a a little bit an exotic one. The implementation of the SOC specifics uh, can be found there, and the actual command is in this imxbootaugs.c file. And there is also an optional memory reservation mechanism via device tree, and it supports M4, respectively M7 firmware, as raw binaries. Uh, I have here the commands, for example, on i.mx7. So one can load such a .bin file, and then one has to kind of, once it's loaded, one has to manually copy to that space where it is linked to, and make sure to flush the cache, and then it can be, with boot dogs actually, the, that core can be started. Of course, much more convenient is the second option, directly using an ELF file, which in the ELF header already contains the address of the binary uh, it has been linked to. So one can really only load it and boot out that load address and it will do all the other magic uh, automatically by parsing the ELF header and, and copying it at the right place and, and all that stuff. Then another way to do it is from Linux, basically using the remote processor framework remote proc. So that allows basically different platforms or act architectures to control, so power on, load firmware, power off those remote processes while it's abstracting any of those hardware differences. So that uh, avoids any code duplication, so not, you know what I mean, not uh, TI needs to have code for that and NXP needs to have code for that. It really basically generalizes all this stuff. Another thing it does, it can also add RP message with IO devices for remote processes that support or need this kind of com com uh, communication. The user API for that is called uh, to boot, it's uh, rproc boot. To power off, it's rproc shutdown. Here to note is that it does not 
uh, decrement the R proc ref count, only the power ref count, meaning that, that if you have a, a handle to that R proc, you can keep that one basically in, in a subsequent uh, firmware load and reboot uh, or, or whatever. And there is a, this is the function to actually get such a handle from, from the device tree, basically, R proc get by P handle. Then the implementers API, so you can allocate a new remote processor, free it, you can add it to the remote proc framework, or you unroll that add again, or there is also a call to report when it would have crashed, so you can have some kind of a mechanism, almost like a watchdog that, that checks whether it's still alive, something like that. These are those uh, implementation callbacks, the start, stop, and the kick. The kick is to actually interrupt the remote processor to let it know if it would have any pending messages, basically, in any of these uh, uh, particular weird queues. And as binary firmware structure, usually also it supports ELF32 and 64 firmware binaries. The Linux kernel configuration for that is called uh, remote proc, and in this particular case, the IMX remote proc. The device tree looks like that. You have a node with the compatible FSL IMX 7D CM4. You have the clock for that uh, M4, and there is a special flag also available, which is called FSL auto boot. That would basically allow, during kernel boot, it would also automatically load the firmware and boot the M4, if you haven't already done that, for example, in U-boot. You can uh, reserve some memory region for it, and, and it, you have to give it the syscon handle, because that is basically where you find all these uh, registers that will be able to actually uh, start the M4. And on the right side, you see, for example, how you can add those reserve memories, for example, the tightly coupled memory or the, the SRAM. Then one can all also do it hands-on using the SysFS interface. Uh, if you have time at the end, I can live show you that as well. So you can basically check on the state, you can stop it, load new firmware, start it again, all this kind of stuff. You can do it for debugging kind of use case in, uh, via CSFS. Then let's have a look. Mainline Linux and Zephyr, they working in unison. They can communicate with RP message. RP message is basically the transport layer underneath. It uses uh, the WIRT-IO, WIRT-Q as a MAC layer, and on the physical layer, it, it uses regular shared memory uh, as well as intercore interrupts, usually uh, mailbox or messaging unit, something like that. And then, yeah, the, there is of course also remote proc that we already just covered that. And on the RP message side, one thing you have to be aware is there are also security implications, of course. Oftentimes those M4 cores actually might have more or less full open access to your whole memory or at least to parts of it. So uh, be aware of that. that uh, you know. However nicely you lock down your Linux, it could be that, that you run firmware on the M4 which basically can just access all your memory. Then as for RP message, so an RP message device is basically a communication channel it is identified by a name, a local source, and remote destination address. Then when you're listening on a channel, that basically means that you have an RX callback is bound and that usually has a unique uh, local address. Then the RP message core, it basically dispatches incoming messages, uh, of course, according to that, that destination address. And like I said, implemented is the, it using WIRT-IO with a mailbox-style synchronization. So you usually have a 
uh, transmit, receive, and then RxDB, so, so called doorbell, basically the interrupt that can interrupt the other core, and vice versa. And uh, using shared veering buffers for the actual transport. Then on the Linux side, how does that look like? You have the device tree binding. So in this case, it's this FSL MU. It's uh, this uh, mailbox unit that is used for the inter-process interrupts. And then you have regular uh, VIRTIO MMIO, so the memory, match, me memory mapped one. And you can have this VIRTIO device. Then there is documentation available in staging, and uh, the kernel config is the IMX M box for this mailbox, which is implemented there in driver mailbox IMX mailbox. And for the Virtio, the config Virtio and Virtio MMIO. And that is implemented in this Virtio RP message bus. One thing. Don't forget to also disable peripherals used by Zephyr on the M4 or M7 side. So, for example, if you have need any GPIOs or UARTs or whatever other peripherals, you have to make sure uh, that there is no contention over that. If you have contention, then it's kind of a little bit undefined. Not they might Linux might suddenly turn on something that the M4 core already has, or vice versa, or change the clocks, or any kind of bad stuff can happen. Uh, of course, some of the newer SOCs, they have better mechanisms, some kind of resource control uh, that, that helps you in doing that. So the, uh, for example, in the IMX7 case, it can be more or less uh, unintentionally you could have such uh, influence, not respectively. That's kind of a little bit the detail. It would have such a resource control. Unfortunately, there is a little problem with that resource control because if you have sleep states, it won't survive that. I think that's almost kind of a SOC bug on the Hydrodynamic 7 case. That basically means you cannot configure that nicely unless you can basically, uh, yeah, you can live with not using any of the sleep modes. But exactly that is, is usually, you might want to sleep the A core side and have the M4 do some processing, but exactly that then won't work. That's why on most systems on the U-boot level nowadays, they basically just configure full access to all peripherals for all cores due to that. And then, of course, like I said, you have to be very careful <laughs> that you don't uh, try to use some peripherals from both sides. The device tree, it's basically the same node as before with the remote proc, but you can now also add mbox names and mboxes. And in the memory regions, you have them to add the uh, RP message veerings and uh, somewhere it's not very well documented, but somewhere in the code, if you look at the actual uh, RP message bus implementation, it uses the first such address as the VRing address. So it does some special handling based on which one it is, just that that is not loudly mentioned anywhere. But yeah, some such details you got to find out basically. <laughs> and then, of course, this the reservation of these uh, veerings and also the messaging uh, mailbox unit, you make sure, of course, you have to put that on status enabled. By default, it's, it's disabled. And then on the Zephyr side, how does it look there? Of course, that's now where Open AMP comes into play. So Open Asymmetric Multiprocessing, Open AMP, that's basically the framework that provides software components to enable such uh, HMP applications. Uh, it's a Linaro community project, and it allows operating systems to basically interact with a broad range of such complex heterogeneous architectures. And uh, helps you in this lifecycle management that we talked about, as well as the interprocessor com communication. And it basically has a standalone library that, that is usable 
with certain art dosses as well as also in bare metal configurations. And the whole point of this is, of course, that it's compatible with upstream Linux remote proc and RP message components. So basically, while on, on the Linux side you use exactly those remote proc and RP message, on the other side, so on the M4 or M7 core, you can use Open HTTP, which basically implements a compatible uh, peer side, not to that. So it has supported configurations. It can have Linux host and a generic bare metal remote, or it can have a ge generic bare metal host and, and a Linux remote. So both cases are possible. It also allows to have a proxy infrastructure that uh, would allow you to basically handle such calls like printf or something like that uh, towards a bare metal based remote context. This is the source structure. So you see there on the lip, you also have the virtio, RP message, remote proc, and as, as I mentioned, this kind of proxy use case implementations. And in Zephyr, you actually find that under modules, lib, open a HMP. Then there are also other communication libraries. There is an RP message light. It's basically a lightweight implementation uh, that NXP Semiconductor has done. It's meant mainly if you have really much smaller cores like M0 plus based systems uh, that cannot live with the full open HMP implementation. And it is released under BSD compatible license. Then another thing available is eRPC, so the embedded RPC. That's basically towards the other side uh, a kind of a standardization approach. So it can use different transports, among which you can also use RP message light. Very good. Now we can actually try to actually see some of that stuff in action. I have here two boards. Actually, I limit myself right now to just the first one here. This is a, an Aster board, which uh, I have here. That USB dongle you see, that's basically hooked up to the other UART because it has a built-in FTDI for the regular Linux console. But of course, because we want to talk to two cores, uh, uh, I have an other one that I can see messages of the other core. Now, uh, let's have a look here. I thought Somehow I can put that bigger. Let's see. I have here some terminals. Let me spawn a new one. So I have here these two FTD things, unfortunately. Let me open those. Uh, that is one of them. And the other one. Ah. Now we power that thing on. Ooh. Sometimes that happens. Now we have Linux booting, which I actually wanted to stop in U-Boot first. <laughs> Let's see. Shouldn't be too long. Actually, that long. So, let me reboot that one again. 
So here we're in the U-boot, mainline U-boot, and you can see uh, on the EMMC, I have here some Zephyr uh, files. So I can, for example, load this Zephyr Blinky thing. Now I can go back to the slides. We had that there, not. Uh, here. So I can, for example, do something like that. Load MMC01, uh, load adder like this, Zephyr Blinky. And then I can boot AUX load adder. And uh, if L goes to plan, one can basically see now the LED blinking node. So that is basically how from the bootloader you can load that, and now we can this boot command. So can, we can boot into Linux, and if one has done, like I said, to make sure that this is not somehow then taken over by Linux, it basically keeps blinking by the M4 core, and the A core can now run or boot Linux. Once we're booted, which is now the case, we can go to SysFS, and we have here in old proc. I'm too lazy to find that. Uh, there you go. So. We have remote proc zero. So, to, of course, if you have a system with multiple of those, you could you could have them there. Now we can look at the state. It basically says, okay, state is attached. So Linux is aware there is a remote processor and it is attached currently. And now what I can do is, for example, I can say uh, yeah, that is, if you go back to the slides, that is this. Uh, Hands on here. We have attached, and I can, for example, echo stop to the state. So echo stop state. Now, when I do that, you can see it will stop blinking. There you go, no more blinking. We could check what is the state now. Offline, so it went offline. And you can actually, the firmware needs to be called rproc, imx rproc firmware, or you can also change the name, but I usually just uh, copy it there. So I can now, for example, copy, I uh, would have to make sure, so mount def uh, mc whatever p1, copy that firmware, for example, Blinky thing to lib firmware this imx oops what was it called um, rproc so I can copy the firmware there and then if you now echo start again it will basically load that firmware via firmware loading infrastructure and it should basically be up again, so it, it starts to blinking again. And, oh yeah, by the way, I totally forgot about that one. The whole point about the second UART, uh, here you have the message uh, coming from the, from the M4 core, actually. He, he, his debug UART, not. Very good, and then, of course, if you have that, you can also look at the state, and it's now not attached, so attached is basically when an other guy uh, started it, not, and 
running is when remote proc itself basically started it, then it knows, okay. That's basically it. Then another thing I don't know I can quickly show is on the Cepher side, I don't know if you're familiar with Cepher, it's basically, uh, like I said before, it, when you're in this Cepher project thing, it has its own folder again, Cepher, and the open HMP stuff is basically below that. You can find that here in open HMP node. And then we also find some samples. Uh, there is a folder samples basically here. And this, this particular one is this uh, uh, sample, what, what is it called? Um, basic, I think they call it. Sample, basic, Blinky, for example. And for the Blinky, uh, I can show you that here. You just have to make sure. Uh, basically, it just needs to have this uh, the GPI and stuff like that uh, defined, not. So basically, it needs an LED which goes to a GPIO, and in this particular case, I, I changed it to that one that is implemented on that board, goes to this LED, of course. That's why I had to change that here. And that's uh, pretty much it. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I don't know. You guys have microphone? Okay, so his question is whether you can do that with uh, Vanilla or, or whether you need any vendor kernel. So this, here I'm really running uh, mainline Linux stuff. So I, I run mainline latest Cepher and I run mainline latest whatever uh, Linux stuff. See, it's 5.19 RC2 next whatever. Okay. okay? Any other questions, anybody? Very good, I get it's getting late and I'm the last one standing between you and the closing game, not? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Have a good one, thank you.